Good evening and welcome to the Academy of Nutritional Medicine's webinar with Professor Craig Shimazaki from Molecular Laboratories. That's the only laboratory in the world that does the Cunningham panel and he'll be talking about that this evening. Just a brief introduction to him. He's um, a scientist with over 33 years of clinical diagnostic and therapeutic R&D experience. He started his career at Genentech. He's been involved in the research development and clinical testing of drugs and diagnostics and genetic testing for predisposition to cancers and um, RSV diagnostics, vaccines, a GP 120 HIV medication and so on. He co-founded Moleculera Labs with Dr. Madeline Cunningham, an autoimmune neurobiology clinical laboratory um, many years, several years ago. And this is based on more than 20 years of research on infection triggered autoimmune disorders. I'll leave him to introduce everything else about his work and um, very much look forward to this webinar today. Just in case you'd like to make any comments, there's a chat box at the bottom of your screen. If you hover over the bottom, you'll see a little um, tab opens up with chat on it. Please put your questions in there and um, Professor Shimazaki will talk for about 40 minutes and after that we'll have time for questions. So thanks very much indeed, Greg. Thank you, Julian. It's been great to be with you and I look forward to sharing with you some uh, very exciting and interesting, not only research, but clinical uh, evidence. And then also um, sharing some interpretation guidance of the panel that we call the Cunningham panel. So uh, good evening in the uh, UK and uh, good, good morning or good afternoon in the United States. Um, we, we look forward to being able to share a little bit more about uh, syndromes called PANDAS and PANS but it's, it's really a medical model for a broader base of autoimmune, what we call autoimmune encephalopathies. And then uh, how the panel, the Cunningham panel, helps with an, as being an aid for the identification of the underlying cause or the etiology of many of these neuropsychiatric disorders. So with that, um, an appropriate uh, dis disclosure that uh, I am uh, the president and CEO of Molecular Labs, the company that makes the and performs the Cunningham panel, and I have no other disclosures. So today uh, I wanted to cover uh, a number of topics. Uh, the first one is the clinical challenges that occur with various neuropsychiatric and behavioral disorders. Um, that these are complex diseases. And then just briefly talk about how genetics influence this. And then we'll have a little review of uh, PANDAS and PANS, talk about the nomenclature and the biological mechanism, and then uh, explain how this is a medical model for other chronic neuropsychiatric and behavioral disorders and what we can learn from uh, this, this syndrome. Uh, and then thirdly, I'd like to talk about the different types of infectious triggers that actually stimulate or actually uh, are involved in the biological mechanism. Um, through a process what we call as molecular mimicry, uh, and then talk about the multi-system interaction and how the genetic predisposition actually influences those that do uh, actually succumb to some of these disorders. And then lastly, what I want to do is uh, talk about the biomarkers in the Cunningham panel and the cell stimulation assay, and talk about the biology of those targets and then what they actually mean when patients have positive tests and then how these are helpful tools in identifying an underlying root cause. So uh, with that, let me uh, start with the challenges about uh, neuropsychiatric and behavioral disorders. Um, neuropsychiatric disorders uh, impact all ages. So uh, the NIH identifies the impact based on what they call the uh, disability adjusted life years. And although this is representative of the United States, it's also representative of, of most other development, developing countries or developed countries. So as you can see here, neuropsychiatric disorders actually accounts uh, for more 
of the disability adjusted life years than both cardiovascular disease and cancer. The other thing that's important to note is that uh, you see the orange line here. It is the impact of uh, these neuropsychiatric and behavioral disorders uh, compared to the age. So we see that the age of uh, individuals that mostly succumb to cardiovascular disease and cancer are generally at later stages of life, whereas the neuropsychiatric mental and behavioral disorders uh, impacts individuals at all ages. The other piece that is also impacting uh, these types of disorders is that the patients that uh, present with these different types of symptoms are categorized then into diagnostic categories that are based upon symptomology. So for instance, if an individual presents with motor tics uh, and it's been longer than a year, uh, by definition, um, they actually have Tourette syndrome. If uh, pandas and pans, you can see their autism spectrum disorder, if someone has uh, hyperactivity and irritability and other anxiety, they can either be diagnosed with anxiety disorder or they may even be uh, diagnosed with ADD or ADHD. Now, of course, there's a rule out of many of other types of dis diseases and disorders, but the point here is that these and many other categories of diagnostic um, uh, criteria are based on symptoms. And so if we look at really how the impact of specialization in medicine actually influences this, uh, if we think about really um, the way in which medicine uh, is categorized, which has been greatly helpful in getting more specialization in particular areas of medicine, um, they also uh, impact uh, the actual outcome of patients who have and present with these complex disorders because uh, they are believed to be, or at least treated, as if they are separate entities. And uh, it's not unusual to see patients who have, at least in the United States, presented with various types of syndromes, such as pandas and pans, may have been to anywhere from as many as five to 15 different physicians in different specialties. Um, the, the, the more common, or I guess I should say the more practical view of disease is that it's a systematic uh, component in which we even know cancer and uh, psychiatric disorders uh, have a connection because many of the immune system targets then produce some of these psychiatric disorders. Infectious disease we know, as we'll talk more about, um, are the ultimate trigger of many of these uh, neuropsychiatric disorders, neurology, and then even cardiovascular disease, as we'll talk a little bit about Sydenham chorea and rheumatic fever connection. So the idea that impact of, of specialization in medicine actually, in some cases, might make it more difficult to completely understand or identify uh, root cause of different disorders. And the other point is important is that uh, various types of symptoms and disorders can have totally different origins. And uh, we're gonna talk about one of them uh, and a mechanism of that today. So an important point is that complex diseases are complex. Uh, th this is a, a genomic uh, study of uh, genome-wide association, looking at the connectivity of different types of genes um, that are associated with different types of disorders. So for instance, uh, what you can see is that maybe celiac disease has a connection with type one diabetes in patients who ultimately come down with Crohn's disease or even bipolar disorder. And so these are just genomic studies identifying commonalities. Um, but what it does show is that there's a heterogeneous mixture uh, and that these diseases are multifactorial and they can arise from different etiologies. Uh, this is another image or another picture of another genome-wide study, association study, looking at connections between cancer, inflammatory diseases, infection, and even heart disease. And so what we can see is there's quite complexity in these diseases, and therefore it, it contributes to the difficulty and the challenge 
in identifying and understanding the etiology and then of course treating these disorders. So again, the complex diseases are multifactorial. You can see here that uh, different types of genes that are immunologic, oncologic, uh, all kinds of uh, targets of various uh, parts of the genome are involved. Um, but one other thing to note is genes do play a role. And in this case, uh, the genetic um, material inside the nucleus um, is actually what's identified in the previous slides. But the thing that's important is that genes are not the sole determinant of these diseases or disorders. So um, if I can simplify this, uh, this is the central dogma in that DNA is then transcribed to RNA and then RNA is transcribed into protein, of which we'll talk about some proteins later on, um, specifically antibodies that are directed against certain targets in the brain. So just because you have a, a, a piece of uh, DNA, or in this case, certain genes, does not necessarily mean that they are going to produce disease or that they're going to produce certain types of disorders but it is a susceptibility factor, and it is one of several in which we'll talk about in a little bit more detail. So um, the protein expression, which is why the testing we do looks at actually metabolic um, proteins, or in this case, antibodies or autoantibodies against these targets. Um, this is the other picture or the other part of this that's involved. So in order to help explain it, maybe in a little bit more simplified example that many people might understand, um, if we take, for example, lung cancer, and, and we think about, again, the genetic factor impact, um, we know that lung cancer, that mostly probably 95 to even 98% of those that get lung cancer uh, are smokers. So the idea is, and it's been fairly successful, is that uh, if we have smoking cessation uh, efforts, then we would reduce lung cancer quite dramatically. Um, and that's very important and that does occur, but it does not at least explain and um, help people understand that only about 15% of those who smoke possibly their entire life will ever succumb to lung cancer. So if you just looked at that piece of data, you might think without understanding um, the other part is that maybe smoking is not necessarily the key underlying root cause to lung cancer. But what we do know in patients that do get lung cancer, um, the genes do impact that. And some of the differences and the key differences are that individuals have um, different genetic factors that control their cells uh, from replicating repair their DNA when their DNA gets damaged, uh, sort of de destabilizes or neutralizes carcinogens, metabolizes them better, and then there's other genetic factors. So these are contributors, but again, it, it takes, in this case, both the genetic susceptibility, but then also an external factor, in this case, smoking. So we're going to move over to a little bit of a review of pandas and pans and talk about what it really is in the nomenclature and how it came about and uh, discuss the biological model and uh, how this applies to other chronic neuropsychiatric and behavioral disorders. So the acronym pandas, uh, like the marsupial, uh, it actually stands for a pediatric autoimmune a neuropsychiatric disorder associated with streptococcal infection. So it was coined uh, by Dr. Susan Sweeto, who had observed uh, a, about 50 patients, and many more actually, who had a sudden onset of obsessive com compulsive disorders, but they were preceded by an, a bout of strep infection. Um, she had a number of other infections that uh, individuals did also were preceded by and uh, these disorders uh, were similar, but to focus on one particular homogeneous population, um, the strep infectious infection and uh, individuals who um, were identified were those who were studied. And that's been published uh, in, in 
numerous uh, journals and articles and the description of how it's defined is pretty well clarified. So we want to talk really about the nomenclature and pandas by definition refers to children or pediatric uh, because of the, of the P. It also by definition is involved streptococcal infection. Therefore, by definition, if you're not uh, an at child or adolescent, then um, you really technically can't have pandas. Um, and in doing so, there's been um, an evolution of this because other infectious agents have been known to cause these, which we'll talk about in just a little bit. Um, Dr. Amram Katz has also identified what he calls ANDL, which is an autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder that's associated with Lyme, um, and these mostly occur in adults. So the, the challenge is the, the nomenclature, but there are some commonalities with all of this nomenclature. And one of that is that there's an infection trigger. And so whether it's a bacterial or a viral or a parasitic infection, fungal, and maybe even some environmental factors, they contribute to uh, the, in, the immune mediated um, attack of various types of receptors or different targets in the brain. But basically, these are autoimmune disorders. The other is that they actually produce neuropsychiatric symptoms or that they contribute to it either directly or by different mechanisms through autoimmune antibodies, through cytokine involvement, uh, through uh, activated glial cells, et cetera. But the immune system is directly connected to this in a way that produces and triggers these neuropsychiatric disorders. Um, through many of the, the discoveries and also publications that it's been identified, the basal ganglia, which is a part of the brain that controls different types uh, of activities, including cognition, um, motor movement, uh, emotional control. Uh, it's been involved as one of the key targets and particular receptors, which we will discuss as part of the Cunningham panel. So pandas um, and the PANS, which is uh, converted to P-A-N-S, which is Pediatric Acute Onset Neuropsychiatric Syndrome, where they still held to the pediatric component, but they removed strep and then identified it as acute onset. <clears throat> um, so these are the types of syndromes that you see where suddenly an individual, in this case a child, uh, may have been preceded by an infection, see sudden onset of obsessive compulsive disorders or various other types of uh, eating uh, disorders or, or even motor or tick disorders. But it's not always the case in all individuals. And of course, we see this in non-pediatric patients also. So the age limitation is uh, by definition uh, restrictive to only children, whereas what we believe and we see is happening that there's going to be a transition to uh, different nomenclature that's going to be more descriptive and inclusive. You may see things like infectious autoimmune encephalopathy, which is what I'm going to describe because it's, it's more general, and or encephalitis, or you might even see infectious autoimmune disorder of the brain or of the basal ganglia. So these descriptive terms um, are, are much broader. They do include other components and other patients uh, and not just limiting to pediatrics. And I think that this will help as this uh, is become better understood, more and better drugs are being developed and additional diagnostic tools are become available. So if we move on to uh, an understanding of what the uh, mechanism is for many of these autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders, as I mentioned, uh, one of the components is the trigger of the infectious agent, again, whether they be bacterial, viral, or fungal, or even environmental. Um, our body uh, normally will produce antibodies that recognize these infectious agents, which is the whole premise by which we get vaccinations. Um, so that the body will be able to take the time necessary to produce these B cells that produce these antibodies. 
and be ready and available such that when the actual infectious agent does occur or the time from when we actually get a, a, a chronic infection or something that's acute, um, the body has to respond and make new antibodies. Unfortunately, in these individuals, the antibodies that are made cross-react with neurologic receptors. It's in a process that we call molecular mimicry, um, or in some cases, it might be better known as what we call friendly fire in wartime. So these antibodies and different types of immune components will attack the brain and different parts of the brain, and they will produce these different types of heterogeneous neuropsychiatric symptoms. Um, often, and in many cases, uh, patients then become placed on uh, a regimen of anti-anxiety, antipsychotic, uh, antidepressant, and many other medications. But in patients who have these infection-triggered autoimmune condition, the underlying etiology or the underlying root is really the infection and the immune system rather than the symptoms of uh, neuropsychiatric behavior. So if we go back a little bit in history, we talk about a, a condition called Sydenham Korea. Uh, it actually was identified back in 19, or 1894 uh, by Sir William Olsler, Olser, who described these uh, bizarre and precipitate behaviors and principally identified in children. Uh, and he made the relationship between OCD and Sydenham Korea. And uh, this was also then known uh, to be preceded by a strep infection. And again, in this case, the strep infection produced autoimmune antibodies, but it also then made antibodies that were directed against another part of the body, and that was the heart. And so Sydenham Korea is also the neurologic man manifestation of acute rheumatic fever. And we know in rheumatic fever, um, the uh, antibodies that are attacking the heart valve Need, need to be uh, at least stopped or arrested. And uh, the treatment in that case is antibiotics to kill the bacteria because patients um, that have these B cells will succumb and continue to develop and make these, these antibodies. Um, and then the other part of Sydenham Korea, which is the part of the brain that it attacks is the basal ganglia, which is similar to those that are done in attacked in pandas and pans. So just briefly about molecular mimicry, we spoke briefly about this in the past, that uh, parts of infectious agents, such as the streptococcal cell wall, other types of bacterial infections, even fungal infections, have proteins and carbohydrates that are common at some point in their protein alphabet to a part of our body. So for instance, there are only about 20 uh, amino acids. And if you think about the letters of the alphabet, um, you can make a lot of different words, but at some point in these long strings, you're gonna have similar common um, sequences. And that's really what happens here with molecular mimicry in that antibodies that are made to these common sequences are then found to be attacking different parts of the body whether it be basal ganglia or the heart valves, as in, as in uh, rheumatic fever, basal ganglia as in uh, the uh, uh, manifestation of uh, Sydenham Korea from rheumatic fever, uh, joint pain, kidney pain, et cetera. And as you can see that the mechanism in which this occurs is something that is, is pretty prevalent. So uh, an example is when our antibodies attack our joints, we call it rheumatoid arthritis. When our antibodies are directed against our pancreas, uh, we call it diabetes type one. When they're directed against uh, our thyroid, we call it Hashimoto's thyroiditis. But it, it really hasn't been considered or understood that the antibodies until now uh, cross the blood-brain barrier and attack the part of the brain called the basal ganglia that contribute to these disorders, which many of them we call mental illnesses. Sometimes we call it bad behavior. Sometimes we call it bad parenting. But if it's really an immune dysfunction, it's a treatable neurologic uh, medical condition. The challenge is really identifying that. And as I mentioned about molecular mimicry or friendly fire, 
if you think about the wartime, uh, when some of our most powerful forces, which is our military, begin attacking our own troops because they can't recognize or see the difference between those that are our troops and those that are the enemy. And what we find is, yes, there is a genetic component to this. And the genetic component that seems to be more prevalent is found and identified in the genes located in the major histocompatibility complex. So uh, these are the HLA class one and class two. And um, what as this evolves, we will find more and more ways in which medicine and therapeutics can be involved in actually targeting um, the root or the etiology. So we're gonna to move to what are some of the common infectious triggers in these autoimmune encephalopathies, both in children and adults. We spoke a little bit about molecular mimicry, but I wanna talk a little bit about the multi-system interaction in these cases. So uh, these tend to be the most common that we see for various reasons. It could be uh, strep. Generally, everyone will have occurred or get a, an occurrence of strep infection, uh, influenza. But it's probably because there's also epitopes that are common in, in these organisms. So mycoplasma, Lyme disease, we'll talk a little bit more, Babesia, Bartonella, and Coxsackie virus. And what we also find is that patients who uh, have succumbed to these autoimmune encephalopathies typically have more than one infection. And often what we find is they can be subclinical, <clears throat> meaning patients may have these infections, but they may not actually be presenting with in infectious symptoms or symptoms that uh, are normally seen. Um, so for instance, one can have strep infection really in any orifice of the body, and there can be carriers of strep without any symptoms. So Lyme disease is, I mentioned Lyme being one of them, it's also commonly identified in, in infection-triggered autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders, but it's very similar to PANS uh, and PANDAS, uh, and hence the term PANS, uh, which eliminated the streptococcal infection, as you can see the hierarchy of these uh, different terms and names, whereas uh, Babesia, Bartonella, Borrelia, Ehrlichia, Michael, plasma are included in PANS. But again, PANS, as you remember, uh, the P stands for pediatric, um, and therefore the idea of autoimmune encephalopathy or infectious uh, autoimmune encephalopathy is probably going to be uh, a more common way in which these will be described. Um, we can also see in literature and uh, in clinical evaluation that infection triggers uh, also uh, produce, or at least are an underlying root uh, of many other disorders that are chronic, but also that affect the uh, central nervous system, such as Guillain-Barre syndrome, which uh, tends to be preceded by Campylobacter uh, infection. Uh, we also see, as I mentioned, Sydenham Korea and Group A strep streptococcus, uh, Epstein-Barr, and SLE or lupus, um, and you, the list goes on. And so we believe that uh, there is a role that infections play in the triggering of these complex diseases, but are underlying an autoimmune disorder. <clears throat> so in, in a way to kind of simplify this, uh, the interconnectivity between uh, the infection, the immune system, and the brain. That, as I mentioned, we all get different types of infections. So that is not the only component, but it is one of the components that m must occur. The other is the immune system is activated, and uh, the immune system being activated is actually a normal process, but it's the actual production of cross-reactive uh, immune system antibodies. And then those that are directly directed towards the brain um, become uh, the, the contributor to these disorders. Underlying again is this genetic predisposition as I described about for lung cancer. Um, so not everybody who gets an infection is going to end up with uh, an autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder. But if you put all these together, 
and you have genetic predisposition or an immune dysfunction. Um, and you can look and see often that in family histories, you'll find many of these patients might have family histories of might be lupus, might be MS, uh, might be Crohn's disease, could even be psoriasis, could even be some, maybe even asthma. And the indication is that there is a potential genetic predisposition for these cross-reactive antibodies or the immune system uh, to mistakenly direct itself against self. So we're gonna move then to uh, the biomarkers and the cell stimulation assay in the Cunningham panel. Uh, it's actually a proprietary assay that was uh, through the work and research of Dr. Madeline Cunningham and uh, Dr. Susan Sweeto, and even the company here at Molecular Labs um, that uh, consists of five different targets and it's run in our clinical lab here and AONM is our partner um, outside of the United States. And uh, I'd like to share a little bit about the biologic targets and what these mean. So if you look at the report, um, there are five different tests that are run. Uh, it is a high complexity test. We are a clinical lab that's accredited and had uh, six inspections uh, from the federal government with no deficiencies. Um, these are the rare reagents um, the dopamine D1 and D2, which are what we call G-protein couple receptors in the brain. And the lysoganglioside is uh, around the, the myelin sheath, around the nerve cells. Tubulin is an intracellular protein. And the CAM kinase, which I'll talk a little bit more, is a, actually a cell stimulation assay. Um, for simplicity, what we uh, tend to refer to as ELISAs and uh, ELISAs stand for enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay, but it's really just the platform. It's the platform in which we run those four tests. So basically the antigen in this case, whether it's dopamine, lysogangliocyte, or tubulin, are placed on uh, a plate in multiple wells and patient serum are absorbed to it. And through a complex set of incubations, washes, and reading, um, we can identify the quantity of antibodies or the titer of antibodies that are directed against these targets. So that's what we call ELISAs. The other that's very important, which is called cell stimulation assay, is this calmodulin cam kinase activity. And I'll talk a little bit more about that, but that involves that we grow up human brain cells uh, in culture and upon these human brain cells, we add the patient's serum. And if the serum has autoantibodies against these human brain cells, they will bind and stimulate an enzyme called calmodulin cam kinase. And the reason that's important is because this cam kinase enzyme is in the pathway of upregulating and manufacturing uh, the neurotransmitters, dopamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. So um, more specifically, um, if we see a positive in the dopamine D1 and D2 receptor, what it means is that patients have autoimmune antibodies directed against these particular receptors that are located in both pre and postsynaptic neurons in the brain, particularly in the highly concentrated in the basal ganglia. And so these antibodies then can, in many cases, um, produce um, what we see is what we might refer to as psychiatric symptoms, but they tend to correlate with mood instability, anxiety, irritability, aggression, and in some cases even psychosis. And so because that particular um, receptor is involved in transmitting uh, neurologic signals from one neuron to another, you can see how these might correlate we also see other symptom association with the dopamine D1 uh, receptor being uh, positive for antibodies directed against it above baseline. So mood dysregulation, depression, anxiety. We've also seen that about half of these patients have some type of OCD and another half of them uh, have these different types of sensory, but particularly we see the um, psychiatric tendencies. With the dopamine D2, uh, we kind of informally refer to that as more the movement band. 
and it tends to correlate with various types of things like choreiform movement, uh, monoclonus and ex exacerbations of hyperactivity, meaning movement and movement related disorders. Um, other types of symptoms we see, uh, including these tiny choreiform movements, which are reminiscent of Sydenham chorea, hyperactivity, inability to sit still, impulsive behaviors. Um, we do see a lot of sleep disturbances also, behavioral regression, and another half of these patients have some form of sensory uh, abnormalities in addition to the motor uh, abnormalities. Um, so I highlight here a part of the receptor which these antibodies can function in various ways. So an antibody can actually bind to the receptor and act as what we call an agonist, meaning it acts as if it was dopamine and it actually triggers the cell to believe that dopamine is present. The other types of activities these antibodies can have is called antagonist, meaning what they can do is they can bind, but they can block the receptor where dopamine will not fit into it. <clears throat> Therefore, although the patient might be producing dopamine in order uh, to function or different types of bodily functions or neurologic functions, the dopamine is actually not uh, binding to the receptor because the antibodies are blocking it, <clears throat> excuse me, as an antagonist. Um, the second assay or ELISA assay that we run is uh, against the anti-lysogangliocide GM1. And lysogangliocide is involved um, with uh, a particular um, fatty acid that uh, surrounds the, the neurons but also comprises the myelin sheath. We typically see with patients who have anti-lysogangliocide GM being positive, um, we see various types of tics, uh, motor tics, vocal tics, uh, joint and connective tissue complaints about pain. Um, we do see sleep disturbances with these uh, that are uh, directed against lysogangliocide, uh, some OCD and sensory and motor abnormalities also. And then the third assay, uh, or actually it's the fourth because we have two dopamine assays, is the ELISA assay for tubulin. And tubulin's normal function is that tubulin is involved with uh, intracellular components of cells. But it's very, very highly concentrated in the brain, which is actually where we get this rare reagent from the brains of, uh, actually they're cow brains. Um, and so the tubulin is a, uh, not only is it an intrastructural protein, but it's also a, protein that's involved in intracellular communication. And so what we see with patients that have tubulin antibodies, um, usually we refer to this as more the OCD band, but they tend to correlate with cognitive interference, meaning patients may be complaining of brain fog, uh, trouble focusing, uh, different types of uh, symptoms of enable the in inability to concentrate uh, and other uh, compulsions. So some of the other types of symptoms we've seen is emotional ability, behavioral regression, sleep disturbances, et cetera. And because um, these antibodies uh, are involved with many different um, receptors and that they also have different parts of these receptors that they attack, we tend to see some crossover, but in general, you can see these things as being um, more common than not. So other things to consider when you look at interpretation of the panel is that only one elevation is required for a positive interpretation of an autoimmune basis for some of these different disorders. Um, we do see, and that's why we run these five different assays, because a patient may not have uh, antibodies against all of them or the same ones. So the correlation is very strong with symptoms. In fact, I won't be showing paper, but we do have a publication or paper in a review for a publication that once that's uh, printed, we will be able to show uh, much more data showing strong symptom correlation. Um, the other thing that is uh, the correlation of severity is less strong. So in other words, um, it may not necessarily mean that the higher the titer, uh, 
may be more severe symptoms, although we do see that, but we can see um, also that patients that have severe symptoms may not have the highest titers. So for instance, if you see this particular patient, um, this patient has positive for dopamine D1, D2, a tubulin, and they're basically, those two are off our normal charts. This patient is bed bound. Um, there's another patient here who was ambulatory, but was unable to work at all five of these different targets that were positive. Um, and in, in one other and more rare situations, we see moderately positive, um, whereas a patient may be, in this case, in a psychiatric hospital. Now, because these are metabolic assays, the other thing that is important is the time of the blood draw because these are like uh, cholesterol and like even blood pressure. Um, they're impacted by the current state of the person at the time of when the blood is drawn. So antibodies uh, will wax and wane or they will move up and down, but in general, patients that are symptomatic will have elevated autoimmune antibodies. So lastly, and one of the most important assays, I should say, a key contributor is the CAM kinase assay. As I mentioned, uh, what we do is we, we actually go through and grow up in culture uh, a specific human brain cell line, um, SK and SH cell line. And we grow these up and then incubate the patient's serum in these six well plates. So we run lots and lots of these plates because we do them in triplicate. And what we're looking for is whether or not these antibodies will bind to these brain cells. And once we do that and they're washed and they're incubated, we then incubate them with a radio label called phosphate T32. And the reason we do that is because calmodulin cam kinase uses phosphate as it develops and makes ATP. And in doing that, it provides the energy in the process to be able to synthesize these neurotransmitters. So what we then identify is we, we identify the protein concentration based upon the radio labeled isotope and we produce and run these um, scintillation counters to find the specific activity. And then we calculate from that kind of complex assay um, the actual comparison of a cell that's activated uh, and the CAM kinase is upregulated compared to normal or basal cells. And again, why is that important? Well, it's important because it's a functional assay that says that these antibodies are capable of stimulating this enzyme. And this enzyme is important because it upregulates the synthesis of dopamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. So you really don't want to see um, an antibody telling your body to create and produce neurotransmitters when your body isn't really calling for it. So with the uh, CAM kinase positives, and you can see up here in the picture, these antibodies that bind to these neuronal cells and activate the CAM kinase and produce uh, the upregulation of dopamine. We see various type of sympathetic nervous system activations like the fight or flight behavior, uh, separation anxiety, even uh, urinary incontinence, bedwetting, um, the other thing that we find that it does uh, indicate is typically there's an active infection of some kind, meaning that a patient um, probably still has one or more infections that may, and they may not be symptomatic, but uh, they're still stimulating these antibodies to be produced and they're activating the CAM kinase. So other types of symptoms we see are involuntary movements, uh, we also see that uh, these tend to be positive at an earlier stage of illness, meaning what we see is the CAM kinase typically is the first one that gets elevated in an infection or a recurrent infection that is activating or directing against um, these neurotransmitters and causing neuropsychiatric symptoms. So um, I'm going to briefly run through in the time uh, remaining just a few case studies and then talk through a little bit more about what all this means. So we have hundreds of pre and post case studies and just give you an example why it's important 
that only one of them need to be positive. In this case, you can see the CAM kinase was positive. This was a 24-year-old young man. He had OCD and motor tics. He had lost 30 pounds. And uh, sometimes this could be diagnosed as uh, maybe anorexia. But in these cases, it's actually an obsessive compulsive disorder, uh, a belief of food contamination, a fear of choking, um, and hence the weight loss. And what you can see is that the whole host of these symptoms are present. The patient was treated with an immunomodulator, intravenous immunoglobulin and plasmapheresis, and a complete symptom resolution in all patients' antibodies after retesting uh, went to normal position. This young girl, nine-year-old, had obsessive compulsive disorder. She had two positives and one baseline and she had uh, compulsive behaviors, but also stimming, which is another uh, common feature of, of autism. Uh, had trouble concentrating, motor abnormalities, uh, even urinary and sleep problems. And what we see with that patient is that uh, had actually an underlying uh, strep infection, was treated with azithromycin, and fortunately when they're caught early, um, the patient had rapid improvement and all her antibodies went back into normal level. Just two more here, another nine-year-old girl uh, who uh, knowingly had Lyme, was positive by Western blot, but she kept complaining that something was wrong with her brain. She had other types of uh, unusual neurologic and neuropsychiatric symptoms. You can see three positive bands here. And then the patient was treated for the Lyme. And as you may know, Lyme is uh, quite uh, difficult in some cases to eradicate because the spirochete actually can hide inside cells. So um, multiple antibiotics, and then the immune system was treated also, three IVIG treatments. The patient had complete symptom regression, all antibodies returned to normal level. And lastly, one nine-year-old boy who 30 days after his confirmed strep infection, and you can see the positive CAM kinase, this was caught early, um, inability to concentrate, separation anxiety, urinary frequency, et cetera. The patient then had one IVIG and a month after diagnosis completes the symptom elimination. And you can see the CAM kinase went back into baseline to normal. So um, we also see that this is the case in uh, other disorders. So portions of autism uh, where the Cunningham panel has been able to predict IVIG treatment responders uh, in which Dr. Richard Fry and his team had tested about 82 patients with ASD, found that at 60% of them had autoimmune antibodies and then began to treat those patients uh, who entered the study, which were 36 of them actually followed through that the panel was able to predict those who improved with IVIG with an accuracy of 81 to 88 percent. So that paper is available if you uh, can look that up under translational psychiatry. Um, and we know that autism is uh, becoming more and more prevalent for whatever reasons. Now one in 59 children are being diagnosed with autism. Schizophrenia is another neuropsychiatric disorder that can have different etiologies. And in this case, uh, a published case report uh, was shown with uh, a, a young girl who was 15 years old, who was uh, treated unsuccessfully with psychosis in and out of treatment facilities. Uh, and an immunologist was brought in. And he uh, knew, the, knew about the panel. He identified uh, the patient having positive antibodies against multiple different targets, then treated the patient with one course of plasma phoresis. The patient had complete symptom resolution of her psychosis and OCD, weaned off of her psychiatric meds, and, and within two weeks was back home playing tennis. Uh, after reading this article, uh, we, we contacted the physician requested a specimen from the patient, and uh, we did indeed find that all of her antibodies were back in normal level. So uh, to sum this up, really, uh, this, this area of autoimmune encephalopathies of infectious etiology um, is really comprise, uh, comprises a whole host of different types of disorders. I've listed a few, pandas and pans, seizure disorders, autism, ADD, 
And it's not to say that all patients with seizure disorders or autism or ADD uh, have an underlying autoimmune condition, but it does describe a portion of them. And the importance is that being able to segment these patients into different, different types of categories allows you to treat these patients in a way that'll actually treat the root or the uh, etiology. And that's the goal of personalized medicine. So personalized and precision medicine, in this example, if you see a number of patients with neuropsychiatric and behavior disorders, what you wanna be able to do is segment those that have an autoimmune etiology and those that don't, because those with an autoimmune etiology, and this is what we do and aided by the Cunningham panel, um, is that these patients can then be treated uh, appropriately with different types of drugs. Um, we currently are able to do this today with the panel. Um, we are working on, uh, we have over 9,000 patients that we have tested and have clinical data, and we're creating an algorithm um, that would allow us to be able to identify which specific treatments these patients may indeed respond to. So maybe it's IVIG, plasma phoresis, rituximab, or antibiotics. The goal is that we can more um, succinctly identify patients who would respond to specific therapies based upon historical evidence and machine learning. So this predictive algorithm is in development. Today, what we can do is actually identify and separate them um, in the near future, our goal is to be able to identify the specific drugs. Now, um, not everybody can have access to all of these uh, various drugs, but the good thing is um, that in different practices of medicine, a patient once identified that have an autoimmune etiology of a neuropsychiatric disorder, um, generally the effective treatments, whether they be FDA approved, whether they be natural products, whether they be other remedies, they tend to fall into these three categories, whether it's an anti-infective, an anti-inflammatory, or an immune modulator. Um, in 2017, uh, the Pandas Pans Consortium uh, released a guidance, a treatment guidance that serves as a baseline. And as you can see, these uh, various um, FDA approved or cleared medications are available and, and in many cases very effective. Um, we also know from practical experience with many clinicians and others that uh, there are other treatments that can uh, be effective, but again, they fall into these different categories. So those of you that know more about these different types of uh, maybe um, non-prescriptive medications or non-prescriptive treatments that have been effective, uh, essentially a good portion of what we know, it may be somewhere in the neighborhood of 25 to 30% of uh, the pharmaceutical type medications that arise from natural products. Um, so just be aware um, that this is, uh, those can be available, but there are also, as we know, things that are touted to be effective but are not, which is why uh, clinical studies are very important. So in uh, winding us up, um, there's other resources that are available, um, some that are uh, out there. Dr. Bullmore has a, uh, a, a relatively new book called The Inflamed Mind. Uh, Brain on Fire is uh, another individual who had autoimmune encephalitis. Uh, Saving Sammy was uh, a young boy who was suffering from pandas. Uh, is now a success story being treated was being treated after being diagnosed and now uh, is uh, actually doing quite well. There's also a documentary called My Kid Is Not Crazy, which is available uh, in the internet. And so in conclusion, um, this is one of the thousands of patients that we've tested and, and have been true, they've been treated appropriately by their physician. Adam Elliott, uh, he was diagnosed with ADD, possibly autism and considering even institutionalization. So we tested him, he received proper treatment, is now completely well. He's many years ago, and today or recently, actually a couple of weeks ago, her mo his mother sent me a picture of him running cross country, uh, saying recovery is possible, he is 10,000 times better. So 
in conclusion, um, find as much information as you can. Uh, educate yourself, uh, physicians. Uh, there are plenty of resources we have on our website. Uh, there are also publications, helps. AONM has uh, a lot of resources. Uh, the PANDAS Physician Network, the PANDAS Network, uh, the NIMH, and even the PANDAS PANS UK. Um, avail yourself of the different resources because education is power. And thank you for listening um, because our goal is to help change how medicine is practiced for neuropsychiatric disorders. And I want to thank you of those who are physicians who are the ones at the front line, those of you that are patients, um, thank you for your help in getting this information out so that others can also be helped. And that concludes my presentation and Jillian, I'll turn that back over to you. Thank you very much indeed, um, Craig. That was wonderful, very, very fascinating and um, some very, very detailed information, I think, on the different markers there that we haven't had before, including statistical information. So um, we'll make sure that everybody participating is able to access a copy of this. And actually, I think we'll be putting it up on our website as well for others to um, access. So I'm wondering if there are any questions from the participants who are there. I'm um, aware that a few people did ask me in advance um, some questions, so I'll start with one that um, you've partially answered, but it's a, a, a therapist who's not a medic herself, who did ask, well, you know, where can we find more information on the therapies that are not plasmapheresis and IVIG that are being used in the States? Is there a sort of central repository of the kinds of therapies that have been used successfully or do you have case studies of those or is it a matter of sort of piecing it together from those who one speaks to I mean I have said to her that we will potentially with you in the future in in sort of um, webinar three mm -hmm. have um, some doctors or, or um, natural therapists from the USA who do also use non-pharmaceutical approaches, but have you personally seen success in these cases with purely non-pharmaceutical approaches? Or does one always need to use some antibiotics, um, anti-inflammatories, IVIG in some cases? What's your experience there? Yes, and that's a great question. Uh, and it is an evolving answer because it is something that even just the traditional uh, pharmaceutical medications are being identified as to what's most effective. Uh, and to answer your question, uh, yes, we do see, uh, we have about 1,500 doctors who have ordered testing and we do speak with a great number of them. They do share uh, with us their results and they also do uh, participate in studies. And we do see that there are those who have used uh, a, a very large number of natural products and combined with maybe some things like antibiotics were necessary. Um, and it does depend upon the patients, uh, the length of, of the, this time that they've been ill and uh, the severity of it. Um, but uh, where can we find that information? Today it is um, right now uh, in, in the minds of these practicing physicians. Uh, our goal is to be able to help disseminate that and I think that one of the best ways is to be able to have and invite them um, to share some of their case studies, their clinical practices. And uh, I think over time, what we'll find is the evolution of uh, these sort of best practices for natural products or, or non-prescriptive products that do actually help and also may need or be supported by some maybe antibiotics or anti-inflammatories or things like that. So it is, it is an evolving answer. Uh, we, we do need, desperately need more of that. And, and I think that in the interim, we can address that by having um, some of these key prescribers who actually uh, are been, have been very successful using alternative therapies. That would be tremendous. Then I think is, if you agree to that, um, that would be our third webinar to set up um, hopefully in the spring mm -hmm. with you and um, 
we, we'll do that. Very much looking forward to it. And then perhaps um, we can set up a smaller sort of exchange also mm -hmm. by email because there's such a need for that in this country. It's very hard to access IVIG and right. plasma for races here, as you know, both expensive and also um, almost impossible outside of a clinical environment. Yes, and, and if I can go back to this, this slide here, um, th this is the key. It's not necessarily that they're IVIG or it's plasmapheresis, but they fall into immune modulators. So uh, even rituximab, although it's a previously a cancer drug, has been found to be effective because it, it actually wipes out the B cells. So the, the important point is really that the immune modulators, whether they be FDA uh, prescriptive drugs or they be alternative therapies, that are capable of modifying or um, modulating the immune system, along with things that are anti-inflammatory. And as we know, like aspirin, which is uh, also uh, has some anti-inflammatory properties, was found from the, the, the bark of the willow tree. Uh, we also know that uh, anti-infectives uh, really are, many of them are fungal metabolites, um, which is where penicillin came from. Mm, yes. So, all of these things I think are very important. Um, and I think if people who are well versed with natural products that fall into these categories might, might be able to uh, also assist and help. Thank you very much indeed. Well, um, it's already um, um, round about an hour that we've been speaking. So I think perhaps um, we should um, round it off there, but that's been absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Amazing um, font of information really there in um, Oklahoma and beyond. And we very, very much look forward to speaking to you again um, soon after the um, seasonal break.